Good morning, everybody. My name is Melita Kennedy. You are in Introducing Coordinate Systems and Map Projections. With me is... I'm Boyan Shaurich. <clears throat> Excuse me. We are both members of what's called the Projection Engine Team at Esri. We deal with coordinate systems, map projections, transformations. So first off, we're going to set up a problem that a lot of people encounter when they're working with this, um, this area of the software. Where is my data? So here in Arc Pro, I have an orthophoto image of Palm Springs area. Uh, and I would like to map the Palm Springs town border. So to my map, I add a polygon layer that kind of marks the, um, basically it's a polygon layer of Palm Springs. And when I turn the polygon layer on, nothing shows up. So, uh, but when I zoom to the layer, for example, I see that the layer actually, actually draws on the map, but probably is on the wrong location. So if I zoom out on this map to the whole world view, I can see that this is the air location of my uh, orthophoto image, and here is the location of my polygon. So pretty much it is clear that data doesn't line up, and the reason that some, what is wrong is probably wrong something about coordinate system and or missing transformation. So in order to understand that, so to know and figure it out what exactly is uh, happening, let's go back to Melita and she will explain all the details before we fix the problem. So we're gonna have three main sections to this talk. We'll talk in general about coordinate systems. We'll talk more specifically about map projections, the algorithms used within the coordinate systems. And finally, we'll end up with talking more about transformations. So we have a couple, we have two different types of supported horizontal coordinate systems, geographic and projected. And what does a coordinate system tell us? Well, it tells us distance between points, it tells us location, and finally it can tell us direction. So for instance, how far is it from San Francisco to Los Angeles? And we've got four different answers up here. Um, none of them are e equivalent, and why are there so many different answers to this? And of course it depends on what coordinate system we use to measure that distance. <clears throat> so what, what are the coordinates for downtown Los Angeles? And again, we've got another four different answers. These are in various different coordinate systems. Well, which one is correct? Well, they all are depending on what coordinate system you're using. And finally, you know, maybe you want to know what direction the North Pole is because you want to find an azimuth between two points. Well, it depends on your coordinate system. It could be down, it could be to the right, it could be to the left, it could be not on the map at all. So as I said, we have geographic coordinate systems and projected coordinate systems. Very quickly, geographic coordinate system, you're on a 3D model of the Earth, three spherical surface. And in this case, we've got a point P on the upper right, and it's got um, coordinates of longitude 80 degrees east and 50 degrees north. So those are angular units. <clears throat> if you've got a 2D display, we throw that geographic coordinate system data up on there, we basically are projecting it into a flat plane. It's called a pseudo Poincare projection. And again, there's point P again up there in, in Russia. And again, we're still at 80 degrees east, 50 degrees north. But right now we're treating these angular units as if they're just linear and just displaying them. Projected coordinate system, uh, it's, instead you're using linear units, you're gonna be using probably X and Y or Eastings and Northings. And now let's look at the parts of a coordinate system as it's defined at Esri. So geographic coordinate system, again, Earth model is a sphere or a spheroid, ellipsoid. And working from left to right, we've got a prime meridian, an angular unit, a datum, and the datum is based on a spheroid or an ellipsoid. <clears throat> so let's say we now we have a projected coordinate system. We're gonna inherit that entire geographic coordinate system. And then again, we're gonna have a projection, which is basically just the name linking to an algorithm any parameters needed by that projection, and then finding a linear unit. <clears throat> so there's two ways you can specify a, a coordinate system. What's called a well-known ID, or people call it a wicked, um, and then, or, or by well-known text, which is a string, uh, ASCII string, that gives you information about the coordinate system. We'll look at both of those. <clears throat> so when you're in main software, desktop, or pro, you can actually search by the wicked. Um, or look up by things by name. And so when you look at the, 
the coordinate system um, property page, down the bottom you can see in the current coordinate system, we've got highlighted there, there's where the WKID is. So in this case, it's WDS 1984, 4326, and it has an authority from a group called the EPSG. <clears throat> EPSG, the name is European Petroleum Survey Group. It is actually under the, the aegis of the IOGP. It originally started out as an oil and gas industry standard because people weren't using the same information. They were using var variations of the same information. And so basically now they have this data set that they publish online and you can download it as a uh, access database as well. I'm a member of the committee that helps maintain that and it's gone way beyond the oil and gas industry now. So basically any coordinate system or transformation someone's using and you can prove that someone's been using it, it can go into this registry. And then everyone, if they use that, then it's much more easier to interrupt between different companies, between different definitions. <clears throat> on the one on IDs, if you see a number that's below 32767, it's defined by EPSG. That's their range of codes. If you see numbers above that, uh, generally, of course, in our software, it's going to be defined by ESRI. But there are other authorities as well. We may change an ID over time. For instance, if we put in a definition, we'll give it an ESRI ID. In this case, originally the, the current definition for Web Mercator, <clears throat> we, hit, we put a definition in uh, basing on what we knew about how it was being used in, in Google and Bing, for instance, and Yahoo. <clears throat> and then later EPSG added it. So they, of course, added it with their own number. So we did what we call a, a code change. So right now, either of those IDs, 102100 or 3857, will work in the software. And you'll see us occasionally slip back and forth between the two numbers. One reason why we do that, if you're working in a server client environment, a server may be older, and it's possible it only knows 102100. So for instance, the client may say, okay, I'm gonna go ahead and I'll ping the server with 3857. If it doesn't know it, it'll switch over to the old ID and try that again to try and make sure that it gets an answer. So here's the well-known text. This is for a geographic coordinate system, and you can see we've got there listed the geographic coordinate system, the datum, the spheroid, primary, and the angular unit. So it tries to be as complete as possible so you don't need to go look anything up. If we now on, add on the projected coordinate system information, again, we've got that whole geographic coordinate system. Now we have projection, the parameters, and finally the linear unit. The only thing you really have to look up um, is the projection name itself. So a system would have to implement that projection in order to be able to support this coordinate system. <clears throat> so one of the tools that we have available is the Define Projection tool. That updates the information on a data set. That's all it does. It updates the metadata. So one thing we see people do a lot is they say, okay, all my, all my data that I'm working in, it's all in Web Mercator. I've got this new data coming in. I'm just gonna define it as Web Mercator. And then suddenly it doesn't line up. Because basically they've overwritten the metadata and that data was not in Web Mercator. It was actually in latitude and longitude, for instance. Or it was in a state plane zone or UTM zone. So only use define projection tool if the data has no coordinate system, which I'm sure most people have seen show up, or possibly someone else has defined it incorrectly and you need to fix it. Okay, now I'm going to talk briefly about vertical coordinate systems. So vertical coordinate system, how high is Mount Everest? And again, we've got four different answers for that, including two that are pretty close, just over 29,000 feet, but they're not exact. And again, that's strictly on what vertical coordinate system is being used. So the VCS, vertical coordinate system, just defines where the origin is for your height or depth values. <coughs> In this picture, you can see that in, in the ocean area, those depths, which are positive down, are relative to what's called mean low water. And that's just a case where you, you want a really low surface so that ships don't go aground, no matter how high the, or how, 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 how the depth changes over time. <clears throat> On shore, you generally have something closer to mean sea level. And again, in this case, now our heights are positive up. So we have two different <clears throat> types of vertical coordinate systems. One is a geometric model. In this case, we've got the Earth's surface all lumpy and bumpy, and then you've got an ellipsoid. That dashed blue line is an ellipsoid surface, and that's, we, that's our geometric model of the Earth. And you can see it fits pretty well everywhere. 
The other type that you'll see people use is some sort of gravity-related system. Those are tidal levels. Those are basically the vertical coordinate systems for a country. They have some tie to gravity. <clears throat> and you can see that the solid green line is also lumpy and bumpy, not as lumpy as bumpy as the Earth's surface, but again, not as smooth as the geometric model. <clears throat> so a gravity-related Earth model uh, generally is related to something called the geoid, which is this really kind of lumpy, bumpy surface. It's a geopotential surface, which basically means gravity is about the same everywhere on that surface. So it's called a, a level surface. It's complex shape. What you've got underneath the ground can affect it, can pull it down. And the way people model it is they generally have a file of offsets between it and the geometric model. So you'll see um, a, geoid, a geoid model will often have a file. And the values in that file are the difference between the geoid surface and the ellipsoid surface. So here is a model of EGM 2008. That's the current worldwide geoid model. And it's been exaggerated 12,000 12, times. So it, it really is, if you really look at it, it's, it's smoother than an orange surface. But we've blown it up so you can really see where the, the geoid is going higher and lower than the geometric surface. So there goes South America around the corner. So a vertical coordinate system has these pieces, and again, working left to right, there'll be a datum or a vertical datum, a vertical shift, a direction, and a linear unit. So the, whether it's a datum or vertical datum tells us immediately whether that vertical coordinate system is using the geometric model, opsoidal heights, or some sort of gravity-related surface. And in the literature, generally, you'll see if it's an opsoidal height, you'll see a lower H used for it. And then for, some, for a geoid surface, a geoid height, you'll see a capital H used. But we don't use that really in the software. We have two parameters that are built in the VCS definition. One is direction to tell us whether the, the, val the Z values are positive up or positive down. That's the direction. And then there's a, a vertical shift where you could put in an offset to an existing VCS. For instance, you might be working locally and you're working on NEVD88, which is a US vertical coordinate system. But for your particular area, everything's a meter and a half off. So you could code that into the definition. So here's the one on, here's an example of one on text ID, uh, one on text and a one on ID for NEVD88, which is again the US, current US vertical coordinate system, North American vertical data on 1988. And again, you see there, there's the two parameters, there's the V datum and there's the linear unit. And in this case, the wicked for that is 5703. So now we'll talk a little bit about map projections. That's converting from our opsoidal surface, our spherical surface, into a 2D representation. Here's a few of the map projections we support, some of the more funky shapes we do. Uh, like the star up the, on the upper left is Berghaus star. <coughs> and here's a list of basically the unique algorithms that are, that are in there. These are 68 right here. There's another 30 that are, that are basically variants on these, these lists. So for instance, Hotina Brick Mercator has four different ways you can define it. In this case, you can define it with a point and then an azimuth, and then, and then where your origin is, it can either be at the center or at, a, or at what's called a natural origin. And then a, or you can define it with two points, and again, you can have a center and natural origin. So this is what I mean by a variance. So why are there so many map projections? Well, if you think about it, when we try and flatten that opsoidal surface, that spherical surface, you can't do it without tearing or ripping or, or really crushing it to the ground, as this graphic shows. So you end up distorting shape or distance or area or direction on it. So let's look at a definite example. So how many people use Web Mercator? Yeah, you know, pretty much every web service is using Web Mercator. So between Greenland, South America, and Antarctica, this is what it is in Web Mercator. Which one is biggest? Well, Antarctica is in Web Mercator. But you see by, if we actually look at the areas of those three, the, the, these three areas, um, Antarctica is actually the second largest. South America is the largest. And Greenland, which looks 
even bigger than South America, is actually by far the smallest of these three areas. <coughs> and if we take Greenland and, and actually map it against Africa, which is 14 times bigger, if you look at the correct areas, you can see it's, it's not even close to being right in Web Mercator. So which map rejection is the best? Um, we listed four very common ones here, Albert's equal area, stereographic, azimuth the liquid distance, and transverse Mercator. And of course it depends on what you're doing. So Albert's equal area conic preserves areas, or preserves relative areas I should say. So for instance if we look here and we look at Greenland you can see that it looks pretty small, it does not look like it's as large as Africa. And if you look over on the east, uh, sorry, on the west side or the left side for, um, for Australia, you can see it looks like it's, the shape's um, a bit distorted, but that area is being preserved. Now for some reason, you, you, maybe you want to preserve angles. And um, so this is a stereographic map. So basically if you're going from the center and you you measure from north over to your angle, you're going to get a correct azimuth. Here's another one, azimuth equidistant. This maintains directions and distances, but only from the center. So pretty much there's no map ejection that will maintain all distances. You have to do other things to help minimize that distortion in that. So for instance, if we were going to measure a distance, you know, from say, um, London over to Tokyo, because it's not going for the center of the map, it's not going to have the correct distance. So <clears throat> if you're working more large scale, for instance in a topographic map, some sort of cylindrical projection is often pretty good like a transverse Mercator or a Cassini because they minimize, um, they, don't, they don't completely correct distances or, or um, areas, but they're not too bad if you're working locally. So what kind of projections are, are more or better for larger scale maps? One would be an azimuth if you're working in polar areas, a conic for mid-latitudes, or cylindrical for, for, for an equatorial area. And again, a transverse cylindrical like transverse Mercator is good if you have a north-south extent. If you're working in like more of a hemisphere for half the world, then an azimuthal projection not only is it good for polar areas, but it could also be good for a hemisphere. So some of the ones listed, we have stereographic, which uh, maintains shapes, azimuthal equidistant, again, distance from the center, Lambert equal area, or orthographic, which orthographic is actually like if you had a satellite, what it looks like from the satellite. Kind of. If you're working for world maps, uh, pretty much any what they call a pseudo cylindrical, so it's sort of like a cylinder but generally it's rounded edges. Most of these are equal area. So for instance, here's two of them. The one on the left is, equal, is a new projection from last year called Equal Earth. And on the right is another, an older one called Eckert 4. Compromised projections are also used for world data. Uh, Robinson on the lower left has been used for quite a while, including by National Geographic Society. The same with Winkle Triple, also used by National Geographic Society for some of their maps. So the project tool is what actually converts your data between different coordinate systems. <clears throat> and so here we have just showing you the tool and then showing you what it looks like in ArcPy as well. <coughs> So what happens when we actually project data? So in this case we've got an input data that's in a projected coordinate system and we want to put it out to a different projected coordinate system but with the same GCS, same datum. So we're not going to do a transformation on it, just a reprojection. So if we're starting on the, on the left side with A1 on the PCS, the first thing we do is we unproject back to the lat long values, the latitude and longitude values. Then we project forward into A2, the output PCS. Now let's say we're actually going to change our GCS as well, so we need to do a transformation. So again, the first step is A1 PCS down to the GCSA, apply geographic or datum transformation to get GCSB, and then finally reproject back to B2, our output PCS. OK, 
looking now into our final section on transformations. So why do we need to transform our data? In this case, our base map is in an older GCS called ED50, European Data 1950, and we've got a route in WGS84. And you can see the route's running through buildings, it's running through <laughs> yards, definitely not lining up with the street network. If we now apply a transformation to get from WS84 to ED50, now suddenly the route's lining up with our base map. So when I, when I use the term transform or transformation, I mean we're changing the data and we're changing the geographic coordinate system. <coughs> Excuse me. So again, we've got our lumpy earth surface, we've got an ellipsoidal model, the blue uh, ellipse and axes, and we've got our data over in the upper left. So that's the Earth-centered datum, WS84. So that datum is, is centered on the Earth's center of mass. <clears throat> Older datums, and what I like to call local datums, when they were defined, people only cared about the local area. They weren't trying to match the entire world. So ED50, or European, European datum 1950, you can see, works really well on the upper left portion of the map, of, of the diagram. Works terrible everywhere else. So older datums were defined for a local area, and that's why we need to convert them into generally a world-based uh, or a more recent coordinate system defined by the country. So we've got two different kinds of transformations. We support geographic or datum transformation that converts between the two geographic coordinate systems. And we've also added support for vertical transformations. <clears throat> So a geographic or datum transformation, so here's an example of the one going from ED1950 to WC1984. ED1950 to WC84 number one. So pretty much when we name a transformation, we'll tell you the source and target. So this transformation is defined as going from ED50 to WC84. So you might ask, well, how do we get back? How do we go from WC84 back to ED50? Well, right now, every transformation we support is bidirectional reversible, it'll go either direction and we'll handle that for you. Transformations are always defined for a particular area as well. And they'll have their own extent, a, a, general extent a, a general extent and a general accuracy assigned to it as well. So right now between WS1984 and ED50, we have 24 different transformations that convert between the two of them. And some of them are here on this diagram. You can see they have all kind of different kinds of extents, different countries, different areas. So how do you figure out what transformation to use? Well, we'll try and help you. So generally, it, you'll either see in some of the apps there'll be something like a fine transformation or if you're working in desktop or pro, if you use the projector, you're in the map or scene, and you go to the transformations dialog, there'll be a list, and we're sorting that list for you. So we look at the data extent, we look at the input and output coordinate systems you wanna use, and we try and put the best one at the top of that list. <laughs> so going between two vertical coordinate systems, Again, normally you're going between, and sometimes you're going between an ellipsoidal heights to gravity related heights. For instance, you might be going from 1983 ellipsoidal heights, and you want to convert to NEVD88, which is the gravity related system for the US. So I've got an example of one of those in between those, the blue and green boxes, NAD1983 to NEVD88, CONUS Joy 12B height. And again, I'm trying to code in some information there. So we have the source and target. CONUS is continental US, that means the lower 48 states. Joid 12B is the model of the Joid we're using, and then we're gonna work on heights. It's opt-in on the tools, so in the project tool, you have to click on the vertical checkbox in order to, for us to, to know you want to convert your Z values as well as your XY values, or your latitude and longitude values. The parts of a vertical transformation, there's a source and target vertical coordinate system. There may be a geographic coordinate system as part of that definition. A lot of the vertical transformations may have actually used a file on disk of offsets, and we need an interpolation GCS to figure out where the off, what the offset's supposed to be. So some of the transformations will have this GCS associated with it. There'll also be a method, and then any parameters needed by that method. 
So right now the methods we support, we support several geoid model formats. EGM 2008, EGM 84 and 96 are world ones that were defined by NGA. We have FERCON files for the US. And then we have vertical offset and vertical offset and slope methods which are used a lot in Europe. One thing that we had that started starting with desktop 10.4.1 and pro 1.4 is that's when we started to put in data for the vertical transformations and some of it's really big. So we just could not put it into the core setups. So if you, if you or whoever in your organization works with my Esri to get your, your setups, if you go to my organizations and then look at downloads and then you can either search on coordinate systems or look under data and content, you'll see that there's an ArcGIS coordinate systems data set up now. So basically any new data we get um, that is needed by a transformation is going into these setups. They are tied to a release, but there usually is only a few things added every release. So like let's say you <laughs> installed desktop 10.7, you installed Pro 2.3, and then you, we want to go to 2.4 and pro when it comes out. If we haven't added anything to that data setup, you could leave it. Right now with this setup, it works for desktop, server, and pro if you install per machine for everybody. So the, all the three of those software packages can all use that same setup. If you're installing pro per user, which I know some organizations do, that gets installed to your user location and you have to have a data setup that also installs to your user location. So just be aware of that. Right now it's about 1.6 gigabytes. You can install parts of it. You don't have to install the whole thing. There is data for the US from Geocon version one and NTV2 files from Australia, Belgium, Canada, Spain, Switzerland, and UK. For the vertical transformations, there are files for VertCon and the Geoid 12V Geoid model for the US. There's Japanese, New Zealand, and Switzerland Joid models, and then for the world, there's the EGM 2008 model. So now we'll look at the solution for where is my data. Okay. <coughs> so, switch, now it would work everything, okay. You guys hear me? Okay. So, we know what the data is. We just find out a lot about coordinate system and transformations from Melita. So is anybody here interested guessing what is wrong? <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. Let's take a look what is wrong, okay? So if I go to, we know something is wrong with coordinate systems and let's take a look um, um, what coordinate system the orthophoto image is using. So I go to the properties and to source, I should be able to zoom in and open special reference. And I can see that orthophoto image is defined in NAT83 UTM zone 11N. It uses a transverse Mercator projection, has predefined coordinate system, using predefined coordinate system, therefore it has WKID from EPHG. Uh, here we have the full definition and we see the geographic coordinate system which is North American datum 1983, also predefined. So this source basically looks everything fine. Let's go back and take a look what is happening with the polygon. The same thing, let's go to spatial reference. Oh, undefined coordinate system, unknown coordinate system. So pre <clears throat> pretty much it becomes clear what is the issue. The issue is that because for our data that we add for polygon, we do not know what the coordinate system is. Therefore, the data doesn't show up on the right location. So if I go and take a look at the extent of the data, I can see that they, the, basically the values are just less than one point unknown unit. Uh, pretty hard to believe that um, Palm Springs would span less than a meter or less than a feet. So, and from the numbers, we can basically start assuming that the data is actually passed in geographic coordinate system. So now this is a little, kind of like a trick, but um, because I know the source of my data, I know who provided data, and I know what kind of data they provide, I know that this data is provided probably in WGS84, geographic coordinate system. So I can take this assumption because I have a knowledge, 
and I also, or if I do not know, I contact them and ask them, hey, your data you gave it to me does not have a coordinate system specified, please give me definition. Um, and the answer and say like, yeah, it's Java Logicity 4, which usually you're lucky if you get the answer actually. Um, so in order to kind of like now fix that, Milita told us that when the coordinate system is unknown, the tool we should supposed to use is? Define Yeah, thank you, Rob. <laughs> He's on our yes. team. Yes, <laughs> define projection tool, right? So I go and I select the polygon and I specify the coordinate system, of course, as soon as I select the polygon, it shows the coordinate system that the data is already in, and uh, yeah, it is unknown coordinate system. So one way what I can do is I can go and search for the coordinate system here in the window and find it out here by simply searching WGS84. Um, I'll just use WGS, and I already basically filtered the whole existing coordinate systems, I can just go to world and here's my coordinate system that I can, I would like to use. Okay, let me go out so I can change that. So this is one way how you can also find the coordinate system in, uh, in Pro. Like if I turn on, turn off the filter and I take a look to full folders, I have way more options available here. So these are all the possibilities for geographic coordinate systems that we have and you can search and you can browse through the files. I'm gonna give a plug for the little favorite projection <laughs> system. Um, it seems really stupid that, that well why not you can just look it up by the name. Um, but then it really, like it, it's like five less clicks if you just think <laughs> and then if you have five that you always use, it's just there. And, yeah. True. Did the people in the back hear that? Okay. Okay. Perfect. <laughs> so like, yeah, as you see, like as soon as I select it, actually it kind of jumped to the favorite folder as well. Like it, if your coordinate system is in the favorites already, when you select it, it's going to not go through the whole file system and kind of locate it there. If it is in the favorites, it's going to pick it up in the favorites straight away. So it's going to be there for, for sure. So um, those who you were probably in a deep dive transformation, uh, demo theater, probably you know that I use a lot of Slovenian coordinate systems. In that case, that's why like my favorites here has a Slovenian <laughs> coordinate system. So I actually I'm using uh, your uh, <laughs> example exactly. <laughs> so I follow that. Um, another way that like you can also do that, in our case it's not going to work, but I just wanna show you that it is possible and you can do it, is you can also use the spatial filter. So, like for example, if you have your data that is specified in particular uh, coordinate system, uh, like particular coordinates, you can take those coordinates and you can use the spatial filter to find out what uh, coordinate systems covers that. So in order to do that, you go uh, here on quite right side and you can basically set the spatial filter. Um, and then you can basically basically set it up in different ways. You can set it up by the data that you have. Um, usually it's like, you, or you can speci specify it by visual, visual, current visual extent that you have on your map. Uh, so there are different ways. Or you can just manually put it in whatever coordinates you would like to, what, what you're using, and then it's going to automatically do that for you. Um, so in my case, I'm going to just use the current uh, extent, which is automatically selected. Here I have, um, let me zoom in. Um, here I have the, the values that are kind of like approximately to the extent, but what I can also do is like I can change the units. So for example, I can say like, okay, I want to see that in the degrees and here are the degrees values. And if you can see like these degrees are pretty much very similar to what we were seeing in the data extent. Um, okay, so let me apply this filter. I just want to show you how this works. Um, as soon as I apply the filter, most of the coordinate systems basically disappear. I don't see any more Australia. I don't see any more um, uh, Africa, Asia. I'm not sure why the Europe is here, but probably there's a reason for it. Um, um, so yeah, this way like you can basically filter 
uh, different coordinate systems based on the coordinates you have, and maybe you can start guessing or help you to figure it out what is happening. So now, like just for fun, we can take a look what we have in North, uh, North uh, America. Of course, Canada, we're not going to look. But like for geographic coordinate systems, these are the coordinates we have. Uh, coordinate systems we have. Uh, and one of them that shows up is also like specific California coordinate system. Similarly, uh, from geographic coordinate systems, you can also have projected coordinate systems. Um, I think right now how much I see here, there is no, um, let's take a look continental. Like yeah, continental doesn't have, Europe doesn't have, Africa doesn't have anything. So it's already sorted. So if I'm kind of like, um, shows North America, of course, because we are in North America. Um, another interesting thing is like if we are in UTM and just let's say we are double GCD4, uh, the folder has Northern Hemisphere does not have South Hemisphere because South Hemisphere is not part of our extent. But if you look open, uh, if you open the Northern Hemisphere, there's only one zone that shows up. And this is the zone 11N, which our data is actually in. So this way you can filter your coordinate systems based on the extents. Um, in order to do that, you can also, like, um, once you're found whatever you're looking for, um, you can also like clear the spatial filter as well so that you can get back to what you previously had. So now I'm going to clear it. And as soon as I do that, I see way more options out there available again. Um, one thing that is also very useful, and Milita was showing uh, different uh, projections. Um, most people think that the projected coordinate systems that we have here, that's the only thing what we support, but it's not quite true. Uh, you can select and des design any projected coordinate system you would like to have. And uh, the same is valid for geographic coordinate systems and vertical coordinate systems. So if you have something custom that customer is using, it is not defined by ESRI, it's not defined by EPSG, you can still use it in the pro, no problem, no issues at all. Um, by clicking here, the new, new coordinate system, add a new coordinate system, you have options, new geographic coordinate system, new projected coordinate system, and or a vert new vertical coordinate system. Let me zoom in. Um, you can also like import the coordinate system from some PRJ file that you have in certain data, and you can add it to your, uh, to it. Um, so I'm just for fun, this I'm going to add, uh, trying to, just to show you a coordinate system, a projected coordinate system, um, how you basically specify it. Uh, yes, you set it up the name like my CS. Uh, you can set it up the different unit. These are the units that we are supporting. There are a lot of units, so you're not just uh, linked to the um, limit. You're not just limited to the feet. You can use others as well. Um, and of course, yes, there are different projections. Uh, as Milita mentioned, there are uh, 68 projections. All of them are listed here, as well as all the 30 variants. Like for example, polar stereographic. We have stereographic projection, but we also have polar stereographic version of it. So that's an example. Um, some of projections, once we add them, we usually don't add the projected coordinate system inside, uh, but you can still use them normally. Um, and this is basically quite a list. And every single projection has its own uh, parameters. Uh, for example, Fuller that I just select has false listing, false noting, and option. Um, so if I go to, for example, um, hmm. Sorry? RSO. RSO. Uh, rectify skew uh, orthomorphic um, center, for example, I get way more parameters, right? So every projection has its own parameters, so you can switch whatever you want and you can use it. One that is kind of like a um, very interesting one, um, since I have time, I'm going to talk about it. Uh, it's a Lambert conformal conic. So Lambert conformal conic has like two ways to specify the coordinate system. You can do either by um, using a false easting, false norting, central meridian, and latitude of origin. But then, besides those, uh, you can you have two combinations. You can specify the coordinate system by two standard parallels, or you can specify it by one standard parallel and the scale factor. So those are kind of like most commonly ways to define that. 
Um, if you have, for example, two standard parallels, you, uh, you specify two standard parallels, uh, whatever you want, and then you keep the scale factor to be 1.0. Um, if you want to use the scale factor and one standard parallel, you specify both standard parallels to be the same value and specify the scale factor. Um, those two definitions are pretty much similar, uh, basically the same. They're just different ways how to specify it. Instead of adding two different variants into the software, we just merge everything together um, because it's uh, easier and it's pretty much the same uh, mathematical algorithm that goes along with that. Okay. So these are a few ideas that you can find uh, in uh, Pro. Um, but I already select the coordinate system. I'm going to show you one more trick. Uh, so I'm going to cancel that selection and return back to the uh, defined project tool. If you know your ID of your geographic coordinate system, you don't have to go and search. You can just type it in. So for example, WGCD4 ID is 4326. As soon as I confirm that, the system is going to search for it and add it automatically. So like in the tools, when you have some particular coordinate system you're always working on, you just don't have to like search for it and browse it and stuff like that. Just type the ID inside and, uh, and you, it will find <laughs> the coordinate system. So I set it up. I'm going to run the tool. Uh, tool as soon as tool could finish, my data suddenly magically lines up and uh, I resolve the issue. Um, one of the things that also, like if you notice, um, my uh, orthophoto image was defined in NAT83 geographic coordinate system uh, using projected one as well. Uh, and my uh, polygon is defined in WGCD4. So I'm basically mixing two geographic coordinate systems. Uh, in order to make sure everything is correct and it's aligned, I also have to have a specified, I, I must specify transformation. So because we are in the pro, pro, pro probably in the background already did the work, but still let's go and verify that everything is what's supposed to be. So I go to the map, return back to the properties. Um, here I have two options. First option is uh, coordinate systems. Uh, this way it's just like what coordinate system of the map I'm using. Uh, this is the one here and you can see it's customly defined. Um, I could add it to the favorites, it will show up there. Um, the reason it's customly defined is because I'm using a new definition of a transverse mercator by, by NGA from 2014 um, because the, the other definitions are usually done on a regular algorithm. And the transformation, of <laughs> course, I have to go and take a look. Yes, you can already see that transformation is specified. Uh, we can just take a look at the list uh, shortly. Um, there are like a lot of options as usual, uh, but what I'm doing is I'm picking up the first on the list, which I'm kind of assuming it's probably the, the best one. Um, so yeah, transformation is set up, so I'm good to go and I can start doing my analysis or just print up the map of the town. Okay, that will be pretty much it. Let's switch back to Lita. <coughs> So some resources for you. Don't forget the, knowledge, the online knowledge base or technical articles. There's a, a tiny URL here that has a, a link to some of them. Uh, don't forget GeoNet. I'm not on there as much as I like to, but if we get a really tricky question on there for coordinate systems, someone will usually at me and I'll pop in in a day or so. There's, and there's actually some, some uh, customers on there who are really knowledgeable as well and generally tend to get questions answered before I can get to them. <clears throat> Uh, again, EPSG, not only do they have this online registry where you can look up and search by area to see what coordinate systems or transformations are available, there's a guidance note you can get as well if you want to learn more about coordinate systems and transformations, um, the algorithms behind them. Uh, it's about 150 pages, I think, uh, but that gives you a lot of background on what's being used. And secret math. <laughs> yeah, the secret math. And um, there's all, we also have a public GitHub re repo with some documentation about the coordinate systems, um, things you can download if you wanted to do some sorting yourselves or, or um, uh, that you might want to use. So that, that link is there. 
And finally, there is um, two versions. Actually, I think we've had three editions now yep. for Margaret's book. Margaret Mayer works in tech support. So if you get someone named Margaret M when you call in, she is like the tops for coordinate systems and transformations. Um, so she has a book called Lining Up Data in ArcGIS, particularly if you're dealing with CAD data. Um, there's a whole chapter and chapters on how to get that data to work with your GIS data. <clears throat> Please take the survey, give us some feedback on this presentation and everyone else's as well. We do get the information and I do take a look at it to try and figure out how we want to change these, these uh, presentations over time. We, we want to re rework this for user conference this year, so please feel free to give us some tips or if you want to see more in-depth stuff. How many people went to the deep dive into transformations? Anybody? Yes, one. one. <laughs> Yay. They, they, had, they kind of messed up our order because they did the more deep dive on Tuesday, Wednesday. Yeah, Wednesday. Wednesday. And then this one on Friday, which is kind of terrible. User comments, we managed to get them swapped in the, into the right order. Anyway, please fill out the, the, the surveys for our stuff. And that's it. We have plenty of time for questions if anyone has any questions. Or you can just go bolt for coffee. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Oh. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> Okay, so um, yeah, it's a little intimidating when that long list of potential transforms thing comes up. You know, I mean, it's good, I guess, that it's sorted, mm -hmm. but it leaves a little bit of uncertainty now as to if it's right or if there's something that's better. And, um, is there is there any way to look into it further and understand? I mean, I, I've seen, I've found like a 20-page table online that has. Yeah, talks about which ones are good for different areas. And right. Yeah. Information. Um, is that is that kind of the best source to, to go to to try to understand a little bit better? Uh, yeah. Use? Yeah. So you know, how do you figure out that like the list is giving us me the best transformation? What are these transformations? Where do they come from? Um, yeah. There's there's PDF. There's a PDF file called geographic underscore transformations PDF. In, in desktop, it's in the documentation folder, or you can link to it for the, via the help. It's online as well. Um, yeah, there's these humongous tables of stuff. So it shows the extents, it shows the accuracies. Um, <clears throat> if you go and you, most of those do come from EPSG. If you go to that registry, it'll tell you the information source, it'll tell you, um, uh, it'll, it'll have comments about, by the way, this was replaced by this one in this year, or you know, you, or, or this replaced another one from a, from a previous. Um, I, I do have action item on me to do some more documentation, particularly for areas where it's very complicated, like in the U.S. and Canada, and give more details on what these transformations are and what they really mean. So hopefully, I'll get that done this year and into the doc in the next releases. So. Yeah, and the PDF, as I pull it out, right, uh, also has an area of use. So, um, and the parameters, and parameter, is if you want the parameters. Parameters is also there, but like what is the most, like what you can rely on is like accuracy information. So smaller accuracy, accuracy of your data, better. Um, so that means that transformation is more precise. Um, there is like uh, mean longitude and latitude and max mean uh, longitude and latitude values in that table. So it kind of gives you the, the geographic extent of the data. It is specified in WGSD4. Um, so this is kind of gives you an idea. Uh, you can help yourself with the, th with the thing that like if your data is more, it's not so much on the edge of this extent, it's more on the middle. That would be probably a better one to use. Um, and of course you follow the area. Like, don't use, um, I don't know, for, for uh, Gulf of Mexico transformation that is valid in Canada. So well, when we sort, hang on a second, yeah. When we sort that list, we take a look at your data extent and we compare it against the transformation extents and the coordinate system extents, the geographic coordinate system extents. So, you know, first thing that's gonna, f the first things that are gonna sort it higher are things that have full coverage, for instance. So if the transformation fully covers your data extent, that's gonna get higher in the list. If we have multiple transformations that have full coverage or even the same partial coverage percentage, then we'll start tie breaking by looking at the data uh, accuracy, uh, the transformation accuracy, and we'll start sorting by that at that point. 
it, it's easy to fool. You can fool it by putting, having extra data in. Uh, occasionally, even a base map will throw it off and think you want the world yep. and not what your little data is. So you just have to kind of watch out for that if you're doing a lot of that kind of work. So is this on this or something else? This. Okay. Uh, the other thing is make sure too to check on um, whether you have real surveyors. I say real surveyors. I'm a geologist. I do GIS junk, but I'm not a surveyor. Make sure you ask the real surveyors if they have any preferences too. Because yeah. mm -hmm. um, we use California Teal Offers uh, Equal Area Projection and a well-meaning GIS person recommended we switch over to 2011 version of that because it's new work. And so we reproject a bunch of stuff, the new stuff, and then during the Oroville uh, dam crisis, we got in a lot of trouble from a bunch of angry surveyors because uh, they didn't have the stuff with 2011. Anyways, <laughs> everything had to get reprojected, and now it's on the banned list of projections. Right. So, I don't know, just talk to your surveyors too. Yeah. yeah. Totally agree. <laughs> okay, did you still have a, yeah, yeah, yeah. him first and then? So, uh, the method uh, you guys showed, like how to fix the uh, projection system when you are not able to see the data. Mm -hmm. Basically, we in our organization, we have like multiple projection systems and uh, we do land up in these kind of issues. Uh, we are using SDOGO. Or with Oracle uh, Spatial. So, I mean, I just want to validate it because we never do it like this. I mean, I personally try and get the SRID fix mm -hmm. and get the basically all from the Oracle Spatial. Uh, so, is that the correct way or you prefer like uh, doing it from SDG, uh, the way you should? It? So, if you didn't because, hear, if you didn't hear it. Well, sorry. No, no. Because we have seen like when I change that and then I recalculate the extents, sometimes like the, uh, the extents on the feature glass are not correct. Mm -hmm. Secondly, uh, sometimes the geodesic, if it is a polyline, the, the geodesic length, mm -hmm. we have complaints from our users that they are not able to see the exact geodesic length also. So I haven't done the way you showed it, but it's been uh, like a regular practice of mine that I go in Oracle and do the SRID change and then rebuild the indexes, drop and rebuild the spatial mm -hmm. indexes and all. So right. is it like recommended or? Yeah, so so in this so the particular this particular question, the data is actually in, in a database. So it's in Oracle and it's SDO ge geomet geometry yes. format. And so, so right now he's working on the Oracle side to fix the coordinate system rather than on the ESRI side. Uh, my personal opinion is whatever works. So if it's working, then that's perfectly good. <laughs> I'm, I'm able to get the data, the yeah. way you showed, yeah. but I'm not sure whether the, uh, whether the issues our user reporting is that is because I'm the way I'm doing ah. it. Mm. So, I mean, I, I try it and see if it fixes it, but, or it could be like uh, altogether different you know, issues. Uh, like the geodesic uh, land between right. two points. Well, I mean, I mean, this one thing you can do is is do that and then check it in ArcGIS. For instance, you can you the, the measure tool will allow, allow you to calculate geodesic lengths. So you could use that to do a quick quick check on it. Okay, I fixed it. You know, make sure ArcGIS is looking at the most recent version of it, and then check the geodesic length. Does it agree with what I'm seeing in in Oracle? <coughs> And, and the same thing there is you can double check and say, okay, does this thing show up in the right location with random base map that I get from Esri? Then again, that's another double check against that, yes, this was the right thing to do. But, but yeah, particularly when you're working with, um, and that's one issue with the one on text and the, the, the way we define the coordinate system is that everybody has like their own little way to do it. So when you're working like an Oracle or you're working in Intergraph or whoever you've got, there's, there's reasons why you might want to use them on the first edge to get their definition correct and then see how Esri is going to respond to it. So particularly with working with Oracle, I think I would agree with you. I would try to fix it in Oracle first and then double check and just make sure, okay, we're good to go. It's working fine in ArcGIS. Yeah. Yeah. And then back at the... Uh, kind of like just a couple of inquiries. Like, mm -hmm. So when we add a base map and we add some data, do you guys auto reproject? Match the base map coordinate or uh, not uh, the 
second thing is not like when we have a layer that has a coding system, I say LL84, and I add an LL27, mm -hmm. do we uh, like yeah. ask or error us and say, <laughs> oh, you got to be project or you got to do something? Or right. So, so pretty much in, in both desktop and pro, uh, once you set up the, the map or scenes coordinate system, and, and like Pro definitely has a default, right? That desktop doesn't. But um, when you add that data in and you keep adding in more layers, if they're in a different coordinate system, we're going to reproject it to match whatever the map or scene is in. One thing that could happen is that there, there might need to be a transformation, but we, and sometimes we won't apply it automatically, so that's one thing to check. Particularly desktop does not set a transformation automatically, and you get that warning message, right? There's a you know, difference. Um, Pro has the same warning message, but it's turned off by default. So like if you really rely on that, or you think, you think the people you work with should be really relying on that, you could turn it on for them. Uh, There's a way in the, in the options to do I it. Where. Hmm? I don't know where. No, I don't know where. Okay. <laughs> you just asked me where if I know where it is. I don't know where it is. I've seen it in the, in the options for Pro, but there's a way to turn it on. So, um, but in Pro, like as, as you saw when he did his demo, when he went to check the transformation, it was already set. So Pro in general tends to, to go ahead and set the transformation for you because it doesn't have that warning message. And they usually also pick up the transformation that comes first on the list. Yeah. So like if you have, like Melita mentioned before that you can mess up your transformation with base map, right? Mm -hmm. So like for example, in my case, when I'm working on Palm Springs area, there's going to be different transformation available than when I have a full map, right? So if I, if I have all the data in the Palm Springs and then I, later on I decide to add uh, the base map, which is in uh, Web Mercator for the whole world, it's going to take, oh, the extent of the world is the, base, like this, the full world, so the pro is going to behind the scene might switch to the transformation that covers the most possible data. It's not, not necessarily, even though you're using it for just a small area of the Palm Springs, right? It's going to actually use the worst, <laughs> not so <laughs> best transformation for your area, but it's going to try to kind of compensate for the whole, for the whole data set. So. Oh yeah, yeah. You yeah, can, yeah. You can always override it. And, and I, yeah. Yeah, and, and actually, I've I've had an I've had a, a a bug, an action item to to try and change that possibly, like to ignore the base map when you're working with your data, because normally that has a much bigger extent than the area you're interested in, and and the guy who's kind of in charge of the the, the map side of, of both desktop and pro, we're like, yeah, we should really look at that. So like my, my I, action item when I get back to the office is to go f make sure there's bugs in the system, basic enhancement requests, <clears throat> to try and look at, relook at that and see do, should we really be dropping the base map to try and get the transformation list a little more accurate. But we'll, I'm sure that would be one thing that would show up in like what's new. By the way, we've changed this. You may, your transformation may have changed if we drop base maps. So. Okay, so I was able to find where the, you can put up the warning on. So if you go to the pro options and you select, under applications, select map scene, there's a set, <coughs> set default options for new maps and new scenes. Um, so here you can specify it, um, some stuff, but one, ones that I kinda wanna show you is like here under the spatial reference, Usually you use the spatial reference of the first operational layer. So when you create a new map and you first add the first layer besides the base map, the, the coordinate system of your map is going to switch to that coordinate system. Uh, you can also specify that you always want to have particular coordinate system. So here is the option. You select this option and you will specify it to you. And here is this warning that you can check, in, check on. So warn, warn if the transformation between geographic coordinate system is required to align data sources correctly. So you, you cannot check that box and you will have that option in your pro. Uh, one more. Yeah. <laughs> so if I'm doing uh, rasters and uh, I'm doing like a projection, you get the control, projection automatically get picked up <coughs> I don't think we pick up map info ones, but I don't know. I'm not. I'm not sure. Um, come get a card for me, and I'll, I can. I can check for you. 
Yeah, email me and we'll, we'll, we can check it. Because <laughs> I know I've definitely seen people ask about it like on, another good resource is Stack Exchange. Anyone use Stack Exchange, Stack Overflow? There's a GIS one and, and there's all kinds of answered questions there and, and people ask, can ask about stuff like that and someone will know <laughs> pretty much. So, yeah. Anything else? Yeah. yeah. I just have a comment. I mean, I happen to be forgetting what it is. The coordinate, is the coordinate, coordinate data sets that are separate um, and then the install. Oh yeah. So the so the so the coordinate system data setup. Yeah. 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 It's it's a little risky having that as a second thing that somebody might not be aware of and might not install. It. Yes. Um, it, because yeah, I, I think <coughs> there needs to be something when it's installed. That Right. The transformation is zero, 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 and it should make sure that that's installed and how to verify right. that it's installed. It's, yeah, that's it's pretty deep and tricky to do that. Right. That's, so, the, so, the, so the comments about having that separate data set up is, is risky because a lot of customers won't know to install it or won't realize you need to install it. Um, if, if a transformation requires data that's in that file, we won't actually even show it. It won't show up in the list. So, <clears throat> so you won't have the possibility where you set the transformation thinking it's doing something and, not, and then not have it work. So we do, we do sort that list and if we, we check and make sure is this a usable transformation or not. If it's not usable, it won't show up as a possibility. So at least we, we can't ruin your data that way. But again, you're right, you might not see that, you might not even know that that's a transformation you should use because it's not showing up in the list. <clears throat> um, yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of a battle between making the core setup like, you know, a 25% bigger by adding in the data or more, or having a separate setup. Um, the, the, the goal is actually maybe even, even the data that's in the core setup, because there's a bunch of data there as well, is move that out into the secondary setup, like move everything out. Um, I know one of my colleagues who works on the server side thinks that it should be a required setup. Like you install server, it immediately pings over and makes you like basically opt out of installing it instead of having to opt in. But also <laughs> like uh, with the current like version of Pro, like I notice um, when you do the update and if you have the coordinate system set up already there, it's going to ping you and then say like, hey, I see you have a coordinate system set up. Do you want to install the latest one as well? And it's kind of like kind of query you and like, hey, then you can just hit, it's going to download again and you can install it. So if you already have it, it's going to kind of pick it up and update it with your uh, software at the same time. I noticed that. Yeah, so I'll, I'll talk to them, I'll talk to the, the groups that are involved in that and again, if there's ways we can kind of bring it more to the forefront uh, that we need to, that it's something you need to do. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you guys so much for coming. Yeah, thank really you very appreciate much. it. Thank you.